Welcome on in. WIP Daily Joe Gilio with you. I appreciate everyone listening, subscribing, following the podcast. First, our YouTube feed, 94 WIP. Check it out. Tucker will join me in a few minutes as we talk about the best team in baseball. I mean, this is remarkable what we're seeing right now. This team wins and wins and wins and almost wins with ease as they move to 37 and 14 after the sweep over the Texas Rangers. You know, they have everything right now. Their pitching has been unbelievable from start to finish. Their bullpen has done the job. Their offense, although I I contend and have contended from the beginning, they're going to need one more bat. They score, and they score a ton of runs. I think it's like, I don't know, two-plus weeks of at least four runs every game. <clears throat> Excuse me, so they don't have any really off nights. And as you get to this point in the season, as we approach Memorial Day here, you know, you got to take stock of what we're seeing here. And I know there's some people out there who say, well, you know, you, you can't really say things about historically great until another couple months go by. I mean, you can. You, you can recognize what's happening in front of us. The Phillies now are just the 18th team in MLB history to get off to a start like this record-wise with a run differential of 90 or better. Only the 18th team in the history of Major League Baseball to get off to this kind of start. Of those 18 teams, nine won the World Series and 15 at least made it there. This is, I mean, this is the kind of start that usually leads to something special. I know now you have extra rounds of the playoffs and, you know, any, anything could happen, but typically, if you have this kind of start, you are historically good, special, great, and and the championship aspirations are right there at the end of the season to grab onto. So I thought today it'd be a good time to kind of take stock and, and give credit where credit is due for this team. Like when we, when we when we remember or think about the 2024 Phillies, how are we going to dole out credit for what the team they've become, the franchise they've become, and this juggernaut they've morphed into? So. I wrote down five names. I have a couple of very small honorable mentions at the end because I just was trying to kind of deconstruct how they were built, like how they how we got to where we are now. You know, we know a decade ago the team was awful, and then they went, you know, kind of into a tank rebuild mode. And some things they did worked. Some things like Mickey Moniak, number one overall, obviously didn't work. They've changed managers. They've changed general managers. Like, how are we here? How, how did we get to the point where the Phillies went from yeah, they'll spend money, but they don't really know what they're doing to, oh my goodness, the Phillies are the best team in baseball. So I've got five names. Curious where how Tucker would kind of divvy up the, the credit when we uh, when we get there through the end of the list. And then I got two honorable mentions at the end. All right, so the five names, and I did them in order. I think these are the correct order of terms of percentage of, of credit. And we could figure out the math on it, but I just think like number one, most credit, and then number two and all the way down the list. But I have five names that are a big part of the reason why the Phillies are here today. Number one, and he gets the most credit, is John Middleton. This is his show. This is his franchise. This is his show. He's the one who said he'd spend stupid money, and he did. And he is the one, I give him credit, for going down a path, believing in something, but not being afraid to pivot and not giving up. And what I mean by that was, you know, Middleton was the one that said, all right, it's time for the Phillies to modernize. Let's go down the path of analytics and thinking forward and being like the other good teams in baseball. And his his jump into that was Andy McPhail and Matt Klintak. Now, obviously, that itself didn't work and, and gave Kapler as a, a manager. That itself didn't lead to a championship. But when it was time to pivot, he didn't hesitate. And he went out and he got a guy who knows how to close in Dave Dombrowski. I give John Middleton credit because, you know, he could have kept going down that same path. He could have said, I believe in this person. I'm going to keep believing in the person. It's In sports, as an owner, when you make a mistake, it's okay. Just go fix it. That, that's, that's why you're in charge of the company. And I questioned Middleton a lot. I thought he meddled too much. I thought he trusted the wrong people. But now that this has all kind of played itself out, he figured it out. He found his way into the right combination of a GM and a manager and stars to sign. And the right kind of stars. Like not every free agent the Phillies have signed here in the last five or six years has been a great return on investment. I would say Nick Castellanos has been a poor return on investment. Um, Taiwan Walker has not been a great one yet. We'll see where the Trey Turner thing goes. But some have, obviously. Schwarber and obviously Bryce Harper have been great returns on investment. But the bottom line is they've chosen the right people. They've chosen people who are hard workers, good teammates. Like even if you know Trey's not hitting great, He's part of this culture, part of this group. So John Middleton, you know, he created this. He said he wanted to create one of the great baseball teams. He wanted to win a championship. That's still, we'll see if he does it with this group. But so far, 
he is, you can't ask for much more of an owner. John Middleton is the biggest reason the Phillies are where they are. Number two is Dave Dombrowski. Now, we could look at all of his things in a bucket and, and all of what he's done here. But the thing I think that is the biggest difference between the Dabrowski Phillies and before is he added enough complimentary pieces so that it's not just the stars. Like in, in, in Dabrowski's time here, he signed Kyle Schwarber, which changed the culture and the, and the winning mentality of this team. The Matt Strom signing looks like one of the best ones in recent memory for a bullpen guy. He traded for Jose Alvarado. And then just little things, the trade for Edmundo Sosa, giving up jo Jojo Romero for Edmundo Sosa. Jeff Hoffman, you know, I know that's probably someone on his staff saying, hey, let's give Hoffman a flyer. And then the Bryce Harper batting practice thing happened. But Jeff Hoffman's here under Dave Dabrowski's watch, the Brandon Marsh trade, making the, the move to fire Girardi and elevate Topper and then keep Topper as the manager. That, that all was a major move. You know, the Christian Pache trade before last season. You know, these are little things. But on a team like this, the little things are adding up around the stars. Obviously, the, the big ticket things that the jury's still out on, Trey Turner, Nick Castellanos, Taiwan Walker. But in general, it's been an amazing run for Dabrowski. And then this past offseason, he correctly identified that unless there was something special out there, let's say Yamamoto, I have no idea if they really even engaged the Padres on Soto, but unless there was something special, running it back was probably the best way to go with this team. He re-signed Wheeler. He re-signed Nola. You know, I think some GMs might say, hey, we're getting close. We got to shake things up. He didn't really do that. I still question the validity of moving on from Hoskins to play more defense in the outfield, but it's worked. For now, it's worked. We'll see. Maybe I'll Change my mind back if we get to an NLCS and they don't hit and they lose the Dodgers. But for now, it's led to a 37 to 14 baseball team. So the overall idea has worked. Bryce has been a very good defensive player at first base compared to what Hoskins was. I mean, Dabrowski's hit a lot of great notes here. He's number two. Number one is Middleton. Number two, Dave Dabrowski. Number three for me is Rob Thompson. I know we don't know what to do with managers these days and like how you give them credit. He's been the steady hand in that dugout from the minute he took over. We're approaching now just about two months. I remember the, um, I think Memorial Day was that giant series in 2022 that was Girardi's last series. They had played that series against the Giants Memorial Day into like the next, you know, the day, the Tuesday and the Wednesday. And I think that was it for Girardi. Uh, he was fired on the Thursday and then boom, Topper took, takes over on Friday. So we're going on about exactly two years that Rob Thomas has been the manager, and he's done an incredible job. He has done an outstanding job. I love the notes that he hits in terms of leadership and keeping this team steady. Uh, obviously, the last two years with tougher starts and then navigating through that this year with the great start. Eye on the prize. I, you know, you could see in him and hear in him the elements of different managers who work for, including Joe Girardi, who managed the 114-win you know, Yankees in 1998. Topper's awesome. And do I have, you know, do I sometimes question him being a little slow to adjust in a big moment like October? I do, but no manager's perfect. And the regular season is really where you need your manager to kind of be the steadying force. And he's the opposite of Girardi in that. And he's sure of himself the way maybe Gabe wasn't and just maybe never will be as a manager. If you just compare the last few here, Girardi was full of himself and a high wire act, you know. Gabe was trying to figure it out and, and couldn't, you know, mesh his mind and, and the personalities in the locker room and the clubhouse. Topper yeah, is that perfect marriage between old school, but he also thinks new school enough to manage a bullpen these days. He's number three with me. He understands his guys. They wouldn't be here without Topper. Number four, and you might not agree with this, but I, I think the evidence and the roster says we have to give him some credit for this. That's Matt Klentak. You know, this reminds me a little bit of the Ed Wade conversation when they won after Ed Wade wasn't here. Look at this roster and their, some of their best players and think about how they got here. Okay, Bryce Harper. And you might say, well, that was a Middleton thing. But you know, that was a, I would say, you know, kind of a poker game between Klentak, the other GMs, Boris, the agent for Machado, trying to figure out which one they were going to get, not ridiculously overpaying, extending that contract far enough out, and ultimately landing the right player. Bryce Harper was signed by Matt Klentak. JT Realmuto, that trade is going to go down as one of the best in Philly's history. I mean, the, the Sixto Sanchez's career has become nothing. Those players that were traded for JT, nothing. Meanwhile, JT Realmuto is going to be a wall of famer. And if he continues for two or three more years, and I've doubted his ability to do this, but 
man, that guy keeps himself in great shape, and he just might be that rare guy like Pudge Rodriguez who could catch and catch and catch. So what if JT continues this for two or three more years? We're talking about a borderline Hall of Famer. Traded for, they got him for nothing. That was a Matt Klintak trade. Zach Wheeler, one of the great free agent signings in the history of Major League Baseball. And there's, I have no other way to say it. Not just Philadelphia sports, Major League Baseball. They got a true ace, a guy who's performed here as well or better than Roy Halladay on a deal that people were like, yeah, that's an overpay. And it was an underpay. That was an amazing deal. That was Matt Klintak. He drafted Alec Bohm, who might lead the National League in RBIs. He drafted Bryson Stott. He traded for Christopher Sanchez in, in 2019 for Curtis Mead, who has not yet to establish himself as a big player for the Rays. And he also signed very early in his tenure, the middle of his tenure, Johan Rojas to an international deal, who's now this team's starting center fielder. I'm, I'm talking about their best player, their catcher, their ace, their RBI guy and cleanup hitter, their second base who's becoming a star, their number four starter, and their starting center fielder, all here because of, of Matt Klentak. He He's part of the pie of credit for this. And number five, and it's probably a smaller one because it's been the longest time since he was you know, in power, but Aaron Nola and Ranger Suarez are here on Ruben Amaro Jr.'s watch. And now it's been a lot of years removed, and Ruben's doing stuff with WIP, and he's on TV talking about the Phillies, but the number two and three starter on this team, and I guess Ranger's the two and, and Nola's the three right now, here because they were acquired by Ruben Amaro. That, that, that's how I divvy up the credit. One Middleton, two Dombrowski, three Topper, four Matt Klintak, five Ruben Amaro. And then honorary mention, we'll get Tucker's thoughts on my, on my five. I have two people that are, are not really loved here in Philadelphia. In fact, I would say most don't like them. And they get like a tiny amount of credit for what they left behind. Gabe Kapler, because he hired Topper as his bench coach. And then Topper, of course, eventually became the manager. Without Gabe, there's no Topper here. And the other one, and I actually forgot about this till this morning, that Joe Girardi chose Caleb Cotham to be his pitching coach. I think Cotham has become one of the best pitching coaches in all of baseball. And then when Girardi was fired, uh, they obviously kept Cotham in place next to Rob Thompson. Cotham's really good. And he's helped a lot of guys on this staff become better than they were when they first got here and reach another level. So you kind of the, the remnants of those managers and their staffs are a big reason why this staff is so good right now. Gabe leaving, you know, Gabe higher and topper and Girardi hiring Caleb Cotham. All right, Tucker, what do you think? Middleton, Dombrowski, Topper, Klentak, Amaro. As we uh, we try to figure out how the Phillies went from, I don't know, underachieving to the best team we've ever seen? It feels weird talking about it, right? I mean, when we considered all the final outs we did together on the old evening show and all the late nights we'd spent, like, it's weird when, you know, someone, asked, oh, the Phillies win yesterday? Of course they did. Like, it, it's almost boring now. It's routine that they, that they keep winning. And you're right. Like everyone in the front office has kind of, you know, had their hand in this to to build, you know, this sort of juggernaut. But I think if you kind of look at the the clubhouse and maybe one of the players that that has an impact on that, I look at a guy like Kyle Schwarber, who who really has set the tone since he came here. He was a winner before he got here. He won with the Cubs. He won in that half season he spent with the Red Sox. He came here, and I think he really taught this team who were really a bunch of losers, right? Like Bryce Harper had never won anything since high school. JT Romuto. And Gene Segura, when he was here, they had the longest active streak uh, of most plate appearances without a, a, a playoff at bat, uh, you know, heading into to 2022. And Kyle Schwarber showing up and showing them how to, you know, approach business on a day-to-day -day basis and how to get to the postseason. And it was a bit of a struggle in, in 2022. Last year was a little more routine. It's just the way this team has built over, over the last three years, it reminds me a lot of the way, you know, things kind of changed for that 07 team who kind of backed their way into the postseason. Obviously, they got real hot, but they had to come back, you know, in mid to late September to, to figure that out. And then by, you know, 20, no, 2009, 2010, it became, you know, relatively routine. And <clears throat> with what Kyle Schwarber's been able to do, you know, at the top of that lineup in that clubhouse as the, the leader, I just think there's a, a direct correlation to his arrival here and this team finally being able to put the pieces together and make October not just a dream, but an expectation every year. Yeah, and that, that signing changed things. I mean, the, the Phillies have gone from, and we talked a lot about it in the past, you know, guys that were talented but had no idea how to win to now all they do is win. And it seems like they can't lose. And they don't know how to lose anymore. They just have become winners here. And that's where I go to Dabrowski identifying that because it's almost like Dabrowski took over this, this, this restaurant that was like not ready to go out of business but not doing great. It just was kind of just there. 
And he could have blown the whole thing up. He could have rebuilt it. He could have traded guys away. Instead, he, he found the right additions, the right changes to make. And it was led by Schwarber because that's that's exactly what they were missing. That bat, but really that personality. And the mix has come together. Schwarber's a big part of this. I give DeBrasse a ton of credit for identifying that. He said on the record, he's the greatest leader he's ever been around. And DeBrasse has been in baseball for 50 years. I mean, debrasky has been in baseball for five decades, including having Darren Dalton in Miami for that brief period of time. So he, he knows leaders. And he said, that's what Schwarber is. He's been a big part of this. The leadoff hitter and the Phillies have been the best team in baseball. They deserve a lot of credit. And the people who put this together through different regimes and years and, you know, trades and signings, it's all come to this, this team that shockingly, and maybe we shouldn't be shocked anymore, has is off to a historic start. Appreciate everyone listening, subscribing, following WIP Daily. We'll talk soon. Have a great Memorial Day weekend.